And let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles with you or you have uh, uh, an iPad or an iPhone like I do up here and uh, reading your scripture from that, that's fine. And if you don't, I have the scriptures above and hopefully you can follow along. Uh, We are at the end of this segment of the Sermon on the Mount. And what we've been seeing is Jesus is challenging the conventional wisdom and thought and interpretation of the religious leadership of his day. The Pharisees and the scribes were the ones responsible for teaching and kind of living out the Old Testament law in front of all the regular everyday Jewish folks, and they were misleading them. And as I began this series six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, out of this section, he begins with this statement. He says, I have not come to abolish the law. I'm going to fulfill it every jot and tittle. So, Jesus' problem isn't with the Old Testament law. His problem is, is that in their own desire to make themselves righteous, they had constructed the law, twisted the law a little bit to make it more manageable and to actually make it something that fit their lifestyle a little bit better. And if you're not careful, you'll do the same thing. If I'm not careful, I'll do the same thing. So we need to come to the text of Scripture, and we need to not take our framework and force it onto God's work. We need to take God's Word. We need to let His Word take our lives and and conform it to His will. And so he's coming in, and he says, you have heard it said, but I. Now, that's a big statement. I mean, and we know he was a rabbi, but he's taking even more authority now. He's saying, listen... I, I'm going to say to you, this is what it means. This is how you've reinterpreted uh, it, misinterpreted it. Let me tell you, this is what God meant by the law, and this is what I expect of kingdom people. If you're going to be in my kingdom, this is what life looks like. Remember, as I mentioned last week, this is Jesus' takeover plan, <laughs> This is where it's heading. He says, I'm, div- I'm calling out people, as this song we just sang, from every tribe and nation and people and tongue and language. I'm calling out a people to live this way. And they're going to demonstrate a new life. And that new life is going to be different. And so in verse 43, he says, You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, something you might note here. Of the six illustrations that he used, the six times he did this, this is the first one where when he quotes the Old Testament or what they've been saying, he quotes a, a misstatement. I mean, this is, this is not what's in the Old Testament. All the other ones, the eye for an eye and some of these others, you've heard you shall not kill, nur- murder. All these things were in the Old Testament. They just misinterpreted. This is a misstatement. They were teaching something that was directly not in the Old Testament. It does not say, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They made that up. By the way, that's not a good idea. And Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. And I want you to love them even more deeply than that. I want you to pray that God will love them. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. And the idea is that don't just pray against your persecutors. Pray for those who persecute you. And then look at verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son, look at the way he loves. He makes his son rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. And then verse 46, he says, if you love those who just love you, that's, you don't get a cookie for that. You don't get a prize for that. Anybody lo- everybody loves people that love them. That's easy. He says, even the tax collectors do the same. Verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, if you're only friendly and excited to see people you know and that you like and you know agree with you, what more are you doing than others? Even those Gentiles, the rest of the world can do that. The people that don't know God can do that. And then this, he leveled, this is the final verse, and what a verse. You, therefore, my kingdom people, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
Now, I have to tell you, when I read that verse, I have PTSD because I was a pastor's kid. We got any, how many of you grew up as a pastor's kid? Any pastor kid, minister's kids? Oh, there's more of you than I thought. How many of you grew up as like deacon kids? You know, you got some deacon kids out there. Y'all are worse than pastor's kids, by the way. I, I don't care what they say. We get a bad reputation. Let me just tell you why it's tough. When your father, my father wasn't a, he was a, a, a senior pastor in a church when I was from third grade to eighth grade. And it was in a small town, Appomattox, Virginia. And I'm telling you, everybody in that town knew me. He was the pastor of the Baptist church right downtown. Everybody knew me, and everybody expected me to be perfect. And the pressure was immense. So when I hear this verse, I'm like, oh. Here's the great thing about this verse. It applies to all of you. <laughs> this is for all of us. And it's not that you just look like a fallen human man that's a pastor on earth. You are to be like your father who is where? In heaven. Jesus, what are you thinking? Well, let me, let me, let me ease you just ease it a little bit and say that the word perfect is not what you and I think of perfect. When we think perfect, we think absolutely sinless, never make a mistake, never do anything wrong, never think a wrong third thought, perfect like Jesus in sinless sense. That's not what I think he's saying. The word teleos means to be complete, fully grown, to be uh, mature. And so there is this sense that Jesus is saying, you as my kids, if your father is God, if, you, if you're a son or daughter of the Father in heaven, I expect you to be fully mature and grow up and become one who looks like God and looks like the Lord Jesus. You need to live and walk like him because that is your heavenly father and I expect you to be mature like that. Now, what does that maturity look like? What's the distinguishing mark? I think, that, I think that these things, as I've been preaching through it with you, and we've been learning, are getting tougher. And I think this is the apex. I think is, this is the highest level. Love your what? Enemies. And pray for those who persecute. You know why I think that is the ultimate distinguishing mark? You say, what about loving God? God's easy to love. Well, I don't know if it's easy to love, but for a, a believer, you're probably not struggling to love God. He saved you and he gave you a life, all those kind of things, but maybe as an unbeliever or maybe you're going through tough times, but for the most part, but he lays it up here and says, I want you, if you want to be like your Father in heaven, you have to love the unlovable. And before you go clipping that out of your Bible, that's too high for me. That's too hard for me. The reason I think that is the apex and the ultimate and where he landed and why he put first 40, the reason I think it is because that is what he did for you. And if we clip out our responsibility to love our enemies, we are clipping out the one thing that saved you. The Bible is very clear. You're born in sin. You choose to sin. You rebel against God. You are fallen. Uh, you will not spend eternity uh, from God. You will spend, you are born as an enemy of God. And he loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us. We were objects of wrath and and now he pulled us out of that, and he chose to do that. And, and we like to think of ourselves as more likable than our enemies, and we think in some way God looked down and said, David's enemies aren't as likable as him. I'm going to save David. I'm gonna, I love David more than his enemies. God doesn't have those kind of glasses on, I don't think. I think he looked down, and I think he died on the cross for the person I don't like as much as he died for the person I love and do like. 
And for that enemy who persecutes the church and casts uh, aspersions on the church and those who killed the prophets and those who, who do those terrible things, God has some sort of, he reigns on the just and the unjust. For God so loved the world. I don't, don't, I don't, don't ask me why he chose to do it this way. But here's what I know. There was nothing lovely about us. There was nothing lovable about us save that we were image-bearing creatures of His. But we tend to think, oh, I know I've got some bad parts, but I know I was cuddly to God. He just thought I was cute and liked me. He loved His enemies. And so must we. Man, I could just walk out right there. But you know better. So anyway... The distinguishing mark of a son and a daughter of the Father in heaven. My cousin, uh, cousin Carolyn does a lot of research of our family, and so I love to follow her on Facebook because she finds all sorts of ancient pictures of Chaunceys and Colliers and others that are a part of our family. And she posted one of, of this gentleman the other day, uh, and this is from the streets. There was a street photographer in the 30s and 40s of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I was born. My parents were born. And that is my grandfather, my dad's dad. And we call him Pop. I mean, he just looks like he would beat you up. Doesn't he? I mean, he looks tough. <laughs> sort of like me. He just looks really tough. <laughs> What's, and, and they caught him. And I just thought that's, I love that picture. I can see a little bit of my dad's face in his his jaw structure. He died when I was about eight or nine years old, so I have some faint memories of him. But I didn't, I, my, none of my kids knew him. But here's what's interesting, is when I, we looked at that as a family, you, if you know I have five children, and my youngest son is Stephen, everybody looked at that, they go, that's Stephen. <laughs> all the close people, you may not see Stephen in there, but all the siblings, m me and Sarah, Th that's Stephen. Something about the facial structure, the jawline, it is a dis there's a distinguishing mark right there because there is a biological genetic connection to pop. And I believe the distinguishing mark of a follower of Christ is the ability to love the unlovely and to love an enemy and to offer love in the face of persecution. It is the distinguishing mark if you call God Pop. I'm left with this after weeks of studying this passage. It makes me ask the question, what do people see when they see me? What do they see when they see you? Well, they may see, hey, he looks like a Chauncey. And I don't mind looking like a Chauncey. We're a bunch of good-looking guys. <laughs> don't you want to look like Jesus? And he says, Here's, we don't know what Jesus looked like. We don't have any paintings of it, contrary to what most of us think. We don't have any paintings or pictures of Jesus. We don't know what he looked like as a physical human being. But we know he was marked by loving his enemies. He, he hung on a cross. He said, Father, forgive them. He says, take this cup from me, Father. I don't want to take this cup if there's any other way, but I will follow your will. He says, I have come to seek and to save all the cute, wonderful people that treat me well. He didn't say that. Is that the distinguishing mark? I think what Jesus is saying here at the very end in verse 48 if I, if I kind of see it, he's saying, you need to look like me. You need to live and have a similar walk. And so when people see you walking, not necessarily physically on the streets of Gainesville, but see you walk through your daily life, they ought to see this mark that says, no, they're a little, they're a little Jesus. There's something about them. Jesus, when he talked, he said, I and the Father are one. Whoever sees me uh, sees him who sent me. And I'm like, God, I want that to be 
I want that to be of me. I want that to be of our West Side church people. I want them to say, say that when we've seen them, we see something about them that looks a lot like Jesus, and the distinguishing mark is love. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And what we see Jesus do, Jesus says, go, baptize them, but then teach them all that I have commanded you so that they can walk like me and live like me. Listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 2. He says, whoever says, I know Jesus, I'm a follower, I'm a child of God, but does not keep his commandments... And this is one of his commandments. Love your enemies. You say, well, I'm a Jesus follower, but you don't love in that kind of way. He says, someone who does that habitually, someone whose life trend is to resist following the commands of Christ is, is, is lying. They're not of the Father. And the truth is not in him. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. But and there's, by the way, there's that word perfected, same word, teleos. It's complete, it's maturing. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in Christ, whoever says I'm a Christian, I'm a Jesus child, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. What does that walking look like? Love of enemies not just friends. So, what is this love? You know, we have a word for it. It's called agape love, and I've taught on this many times. You've heard it probably. If you've grown up in church, you've heard about agape love, but it is not a, it's not a phileo love. I tell you, when I walk in here, I feel a lot of phileo for you folks. You probably didn't realize that. That means friendship love. I mean, I love seeing your faces. I love being here. I love that when I walk in, I have warm, fuzzy feelings when I see most of you. And, uh, and all of you. Then there's eros love. There's romantic love. I see that. When I see my wife, I have that eros, romantic love. And then there's agape love. Agape love is not a feeling. It's an action. It's an intentional act of sacrificial work for the well-being of another person. Spiritually, emotionally, relationally, theologically. And I know I try to have agape for you in that, in that there's times that I will sacrifice for you and you'll have that and you'll sacrifice for me. But the, the height of agape, sacrificial love is when you will offer that love to someone who will not love you back. You'll offer it to someone you do not like and who does not like you. And you will offer it even to someone who is actively persecuting you. And not only will you turn around and somehow love them and, and hope for their well-being, you'll pray for their well-being. Well, that's a level of life that's challenging, isn't it? This kind of love that marks us is an unconditional love. It's an unconditional love. Or I almost use the word unlimited because we like to put limits on people we'll love or behaviors will, you know, well, you just crossed the line. You're dead to me. You would never say that, but in your mind, you know, you're, that person's dead to me. Just wait, I'm going to get them back. You just wait. You're on my list. And we, put, we draw the line. What line? You just cross the line. What line? If, if he says, love your enemies, what line is there that a person crosses that I say, oh, you just went from I can love you to I can't love you? If that were the case, every single one of us would have been on the wrong side of the line and we would perish forever. He loved us on the wrong side of the line. Am I making sense? He loved us as enemies. So we turn around and we have this kind of ability and we should to include in our circle of sacrifice and, and love, unconditional love, we can include even our enemies. And uh, the, the um, scribes and the Pharisees and really the whole nation of Israel had missed understood or intentionally changed what was told in, in Leviticus chapter 19. In Leviticus chapter 19, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you'll turn there in verse 13 through 18, you'll see all of the neighbor terminology. 
And this is the law right from Moses to the people of Israel about how they were to treat their neighbor. Don't oppress your neighbor. Uh, don't judge your neighbor. Uh, he says, judge your neighbor in righteousness. Uh, do not stand up against the life of your neighbor, verse 16. Uh, verse 17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, unless you incur sin because of him. And then in verse 18, it says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as what? Yourself, I am the Lord. How many of you thought Jesus came up with that? Well, he did. He just wrote it in the Old Testament too. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if we go back to this original quote back in verse 43, Jesus says, you have heard itself, you have heard it said, love your neighbor. So they had cut off as yourself and had added something that's not in the Old Testament and hate your enemy. Where did they come up with that? Well, when the people of Israel moved into the land of Cana, they were given instructions and God said, you need to drive the inhabitants of this land out. The Canaanites, um, the Amorites, all of these ites that were in their land. And, and, and you need to destroy them and get them out. And, and they had misinterpreted what was the will of God, of a judicial act of God. This was God's will. He told them, this is your land. You need to go and deal with them. And by the way, these people groups had experienced grace they had experienced hundreds and hundreds of years of rain and sunshine from the Lord, and yet they were terribly immoral people. The, 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 the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, were they offered human sacrifice. They would often burn their babies and offer them to Moloch in the furnaces. These were not good people, and it, it doesn't mean that you kill bad people. It just means that this was a legitimate God-endorsed movement when, when he said, you go into Israel, and I need, this is your land, and uh, I need you to move these folks out, and don't intermarry with, with them. This is key because you are my people. And so that was part of God's kingship and his will for a specific time. Now, here's what they had done. They'd said, well, obviously, those are our enemies, and anybody we don't like, we have to hate them. And he never told them to hate them. And so they expanded their, their uh, definition of hate and limited their definition of neighbor. And if you're, if you're um, for instance, for instance, it was a just thing that we went and we took military, and some of you may have been a part of that, although it's, World War II is far behind us now. We sent military people to judiciously and justly stop the Nazis from destroying the Jewish people and destroying the Polish people and all these kind of things. That was a legitimate deal, and that was a governmental action. We talked about that last week. But in our personal walk, our personal walk, we do not have the right to say, I do not love even my enemy. I can love them sometimes by stopping them from doing evil. And so that's another message. But um, they, had, they had expanded their definition of hate from doing the will of God to and limited their definition of a neighbor. So I meditated on this. It kind of hit me clearly what Jesus is saying. When, when we choose to follow Jesus, we lose the choice of who we get to love. You choose Jesus, you can't choose who you love. Now, I'm not talking about who you marry. I'm talking about who you love. With agape love, he says, love even your enemies. When you choose Jesus, you lose that choice because Jesus loved even his enemies. So we're marked by this kind of unconditional love. I like to think of it as light and salt. Remember he says, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Does light, then when I turn that light on, does that light go, well, I... I don't like that darkness over there, so I'm only going to illuminate this darkness. You turn the light on, whatever darkness is there gets illuminated. 
Whoever God puts into your sphere of life, you are to what? Love. Doesn't mean you like everything. It doesn't mean you endorse behavior. Uh, it doesn't mean you allow them to abuse you. You call the police the, to break the law. That goes back to last week's message. But you have to uh, have a, a, an attitude of love towards people because of God's choice of you. It's unconditional. Salt, the same way. If you were sprinkled here in Gainesville, you're sprinkled out there in UF, you're sprinkled into the hospital system or you're in a school system, wherever God salts the earth with you, you bring it flavor, you reign on the just and on the unjust. So you're marked by that kind of love. Let me give you a second thing. That kind of love is supernatural. Look at verse 46. It's, a su it's not natural for us to love this way. So if you feel uncomfortable about this kind of love, Congratulations, you're a human being. You're not designed to do this. You need to have an internal transformation by the Holy Spirit that redesigns and re-postures uh, uh, your heart towards even your enemies. Because look at what Matthew says, verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. It dawned on me, who wrote the book of Matthew? A tax collector, an ex-tax collector. Who were the lowest forms of human life amongst the Jewish people? Those traitors, tax collectors, they used Jews who would collect their, the taxes from the Jewish people. They were working for the Romans. These were the worst of the worst who were Jewish people. And he says, even the tax collectors, they're the worst of the worst. They love people that like them. They love their family. They love their brothers. Verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, if they're the, the people that you greet when you walk into church, if you walk into church and you won't, talk, you won't look or talk to anybody except you finally see somebody, you know, oh, I'm just hoping you'll just walk in like you're weird. I'm so glad to see you. I don't know you, but I want you to know I'm glad you are here. I'm glad you're here. It's kind of a silly example, but we are sometimes so attached to how people feel about us, respond to us, how they look at us, that we only love back and give light and salt back to people who treat us a specific way, look at us a specific way, love us a specific way. And Jesus is saying, no, go in with an attitude of open-heartedness towards, uh, towards those. He says, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Everybody does that. Even the Gentiles do that. How many of you love your country? Man, I love, I love, we're not, that's not unusual. You don't have to be a Christian to love your country. How many of you love coming to church and hanging out? Man, thank you, most of you. That's awesome. I'm hoping the rest of you will love it. Man, I love, you're, it's not unusual for the people that are at church to actually like being at church. Most of you love, you love being around your friends, you love, you're all sitting by people. What you are doing is not unusual to you, and it's not unusual for the people that are hanging out at the bars, wherever they are, or at the ball games, or at the bowling alley, or at the, you know, out on the boats, or wherever. People love to do that. It is not unusual for you to like being around people, to go to places and events that you're comfortable with. It is not unusual for you to like people that are the same political views, ethical views, moral views, that have the same family values, who agree with you who would vote like you. It's not, it's not unusual for you to want to be around those folks and love those kind of people. You can be completely lost without the Holy Spirit and love all of that. But this kind of love of enemies, to consistently have a posture of love towards people who will not or may actively not love you, to have that kind of continual posture is super natural. It's unnatural. And I think that's why God says it. And I think that's why 
it should not be too much of an expectation if we call God pop at Westside. The people of Gainesville, when they meet us and see us on the streets and in the classrooms and at work, when they see us, that we're marked by love. What are we known for as a church? What a great vision this is, isn't it? I know they know we love music. And we got a great choir, orchestra. We got all that. We love music. How many of you love music? I love worship music. You just heard me up here singing. I love to sing. I love music. How many of you love God's Word? I love preaching and teaching and studying. I even like listening to sermons and listen. I love God's Word. I love our country. I love the unborn. And I love to uh, be a voice for the voiceless. Uh, but you, can, you don't have to be a Christian to do that. I love uh, uh, kids and teenagers and children. We are, we are a church that's known for our family ministry. We love college students, and we want to be known for loving college students. But I'm just, and we love fellowship. We like getting together. And I'm telling you, I, I just was convicted. All of that stuff is wonderful, but none of that stuff is really that hard or outside of my ability to accomplish in the flesh. But Jesus said, you are to be fully mature like your pop who loves even his enemies. It's supernatural. It's unconditional. And let me give one final thing before I let you go. It's also, I want, to, I want you to know it's possible. Jesus lives in you, and when he hung on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what to do. Look at Stephen. Remember Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7. He's being stoned by his persecutors. Paul's over there holding the robes of the folks that are throwing the stones. Or Saul's over there. He turns into Paul later. And Stephen looks at them. He falls on his knees. He cries out with a loud voice, kill my enemies. He cries out with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. It's possible. The Holy Spirit can do that kind of work in your heart and in your mind. Three things make this possible. First, you must have a new birth in Christ. A new birth. There must be a spiritual transformation that happens internally for this to become the pattern of your life. And it doesn't happen overnight. And you're going to have challenges. It's not going to be, uh, you're not going to be perfect in that. But I think there should be a growing trend. Where does it start? Let's think about it this way. So I'm about to close this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Begin, remember where he began this section? It was with the Beatitudes. And the, the Beatitudes are the, is the internal heart posture of the kingdom people, the people that he has in his kingdom. I think that he started with the Beatitudes because of the things he was going to be asking the people that are like this to be and do. He knew there was no way that someone's going to be able to turn the other cheek, no way they're going to be able to love their enemies until they have an attitude like this, poor in spirit, mourning their sinfulness, meek, hungering and thirsting for what? Righteousness merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. He started off this entire sermon by saying, oh, this has got to be your heart. And that kind of heart comes through a new birth. It comes when you meet Jesus and trust Jesus and his Holy Spirit gives you the capacity to see your spiritual brokenness and your, your uh, uh, bankruptcy spiritually and then to mourn after that and then to hunger. God, I want to be, I'm thirsty for this righteousness. Help me to live this way. And it, it gives you a posture of meekness, which is strength under control. It gives you a posture of mercy towards people. And he gives you a posture of being a peacemaker. And so he starts with new birth in Christ. But even then, there has to be, in a sense, to live this way, a continual death to selfishness, a, self, a, a death to self. 
This is, this is where the rubber meets the road kind of in our daily life is how do I get to where I don't immediately retaliate and get so mad at my enemy that I can't love them and I can't pray for them? How do I get to that point? Let me suggest a couple of things. Not only must there be a, 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 a humility by knowing this is the kind of love that Christ showed you so you can show it to other people. There's got to be a healthy detachment from other human beings. Now, I, I am on the sensitive side of the spectrum in personality temperaments. I have often prayed and wished I was on the other side where I just kind of went through life and I, did, I wasn't sensitive to looks and stares and, and comments and tones and voices. And I'm, I tend to be a little bit sensitive to those kind of things. So uh, remember that. <laughs> I've grown a lot in that, especially I had to. Because I didn't, it just would make me mad all the time or I'd be hurt all the time. And hurt people hurt, right? So I've, there's got to be a healthy detachment from the way people look at you and talk to you and treat you. And, and I, I have found that it, it has to be something I think about ahead of time. It's got I can't let my happiness and my response to people be dependent on how they initially treat and interact with me. I've got to do that. Or I live on a roller coaster of hurt and anger. Right? And so there's a, the only way to get detached like that is not that you don't care, but that you are anchored securely anchored to your identity and securely anchored to the love and acceptance you already know you have from the Lord of the universe. You are anchored to that. You say, well, you want me to just be cold and walk around like a robot. No, I want you to be, listen, what, listen how Jesus was. Was Jesus sensitive to the people around him? Yes. He noticed everybody. Remember, he's walking through the crowd and he's pressed in and some, some lady just reaches out. She's probably laying on the ground. She reaches out and touches the hem of his garment and he stops. And he's crushed with this crowd and he says, who touched me? They, go, they laugh. They're like, yeah, right. Who touched me? He was the most sensitive person who ever lived. He knew what those Pharisees were thinking before they ever even said. Talk about sensitive. He could read their minds. Some of you are mind readers too. My wife can read mine. It's scary. She's like, why did you just think that? I'm like, I didn't think anything. I promise. You did. I know. I saw it. I heard it. I said, I didn't say. Some people are so in tune. He was more in tune than anybody, but he had a detachment that he was able to not let the reactions and his enemies and the persecution determine anything. Several times he says, well, I, I know you want me to go to the town and you want me to go in and make a big show, but now is not the hour. He, did, he wasn't pushed by his friends and he wasn't um, uh, baited into reactions by his enemies. He said, what the Father tells me to do, I do. And so I think growing, mature Christian life is a, is a great sensitivity to people, but that when you sense you're not loved by that person, when you sense that, they, they, that they're, being, uh, they're persecuting you, or you sense those things, it doesn't shut off your love vow and say, oh, you're dead to me. You cross the line. There's a continual death to self. I think one of the great sufferings of our life as human beings, and it's tough, is the degree to which our thinking and our acting and our, our behavior is entirely governed by the actions of other people. Death to self. One of the ways that I practice doing this, and I, this comes with time, 
and with teaching and with study in your word, here's how you begin to see people not as persecutors. You begin to see them. That's who I was before I met Christ. That's who, that's the deception of the devil in, in the world. That's the deception of the world system. And so I can see my persecutor, if they're not believers, I can see them dead in their trespasses and sins. I can see they're deceived victims of the very active Satan. And they're deceived and pulled apart as, as by, the, by a world full of idols. You see your enemy is perishing and in need of mercy. And I see uh, uh, immature believers. And a lot of times believers can be your persecutors and your enemies. And you can see them uh, in their immaturity and their need for discipleship. They don't need retribution. You are that opportunity to love them. And so think of that. And then one more thing before I close. Sometimes... When you are actively loving your enemy, (laughs) they do not think you're loving. It's called tough love. There are times where you are actively, you know, I am doing the most loving thing I can do for you. But you may never see it as love, never receive it as love, but I have no choice. Agape love determines this. I think of it, I told the first service, is there any moment, is there ever a reason that someone might knock you out and cut your foot off? And I had their attention. Well, yeah, if that person is a doctor and you have a foot that's infected full of gangrene, and if they don't cut that foot off, it's going to infect and kill the rest of your body. I think of it, in, you do it with your children. Tough love. The, how many of you ever had the broccoli battles? I mean, I'm like, I'm, now children are actively telling their, their parents here at Westside, the pastor said we can eat as many French fries as we want. <laughs> Amen. Well, let me just tell you, you need to eat broccoli too. You need to eat your vegetables. We do all those kind of things. And so... The world may not receive your love as love, but you must love anyway. The most loving, the most unloving thing I can do sometimes for one of my enemies is to tell that person who sees themselves as my enemy and someone who's persecuting me, in particular for a biblical or a Christian belief, I can't do anything about it, it's just, is to turn around and say, listen, the, I can't condone the deception that you've fallen under. I can't condone your behavior. I can't condone what you believe. I can't allow you to continue to send uh, the Jews to the gas chambers. I need to take the most loving thing I can do is stop you from what you're doing. And so sometimes that love is tough love, but it's love none the less. You know what I find with a lot of believers is sometimes Giving tough love to someone you really do love is harder than giving love to people you don't love. Because you'd want that person you truly love to like you and to think you're awesome. And so you don't do the loving thing and tell them the truth. And so tough love and detachment are some of the ways that I think we are able to do it. What does love look like? What is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? I'd like to encourage you maybe to go to Luke chapter 10 when you get home and read again the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, Jesus is telling this lesson and they're all like, the guy comes up and says, well, okay, who's my neighbor? And he shouldn't have asked that question. Jesus had a great answer. And he tells the story, you know, of the man who's on his way to Jericho in a very dangerous area on that path from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he's hit by uh, robbers and they take him stuff, leave him for dead. Then the priest comes by and walks around him, ignores him. Then the Levite comes, walks around him and ignores him. And then just in this brilliant twist, Jesus says, a Samaritan 
who were the, uh, the ultimate enemies of the Jews of that day, uh, well, n- n- second to the Romans. But the Samaritans came by who were just considered terrible. That was the enemy. Turned around and helped this man. Say, so what does love look like? Here's a Samaritan loving his enemy. And I, I just read it again this week, and I was blown away. It says, He came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. How do you see your enemy? And do you have compassion? And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, I can tell you what most of us would have done. We'd have called 911. No 911, or I would have run to get help. But I, I think Jesus intentionally said, no, he got off of his ride and he gave his resources. He, he used the medicinal wine and all those things. He bandaged this man up with his own stuff. He put his hands on his enemy, his healing work on his enemy. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. That's a, that walk, he's walking. Just picture him. He said, I'll get off my horse or whatever it was, and you get on. And he walks him all the way down. And then he brings him to the inn. I mean, Jesus won't even stop with this analogy. He keeps going. And he says, he brings him to the inn, this enemy, and, and then he takes out two denarii and gives it to the innkeeper and says, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I came back. You know that that looked like today. We walk into the Hampton Inn, we check him in and we call and we give them our credit card and leave it with them. Say, so take care of the expenses. When I get back, I'll cover the cost. That's exactly what Jesus did for you. He covered the cost of your sin. He bound up your wounds. And by his stripes, we are healed. And he turns around and he says, that's what my pop looks like. Hebrews says that he is the, Jesus was the exact image of the nature of God. When he came, we beheld the glory of God. And Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen Pop. This is what he's like. And then he turns around and he says, now go and do likewise. Go and do likewise.